This subject, as I just said, of murmuring, complaining, and grumbling against the Lord, the reason it's so important is because when you murmur, complain, and grumble, it's the ultimate proof that you don't have faith. It's the exact opposite of faith, complaining. Here's a good definition of unbelief. Calling God a liar. It's probably the most explicit, profound, and disastrous definition for my life. Whenever I say, God, I can't believe that. When God told Moses, I will bring quail. And Moses said, but God, how? God said, is anything too hard for my power? Are you calling me a liar, Moses? Now, nobody in their right mind would turn to God and go, God, you're a liar. I mean, I even shiver just giving it as an example. But we do it every time we complain. God! Or we don't believe. We're calling him a liar. Okay. Let's turn to chapter 13 of Numbers. The complaint of men who are given a task. Or you can also subtitle this, A Bad Report. <laughs> Summering up the last two areas, the complaint of the flesh, desires, or appetites, one and two, the complaint of those who are close to you because you're being raised up. It's jealousy. That complaint is called jealousy. <laughs> Summing them up is that in our day and age, we have just as many appetites, if not more, things to have an appetite over. <laughs> we have, you know, cosmic appetites now, modern disco appetites. You know, they didn't have to worry about the children of Israel discoing around the golden calf. They had their own demonic orgies out there. And uh, never have so many people been able to get so close as today through mass communication and mass transportation. And so the jealousy of today, it's like the idols in those days were calves. The idols in these days are John Travolta's and Paul Newman's. And how men are jealous of these idols. I've, I've had uh, Matthew, Matthew Ward of the second chapter of Acts told me he got a letter from this guy. He's Christian. Now, I thought you were the, the best thing in Christian music until my girlfriend came and wanted to counsel with you at a second chapter of Acts concert. <laughs> counsel, of course. You know, he goes, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, some girl came up to him and says, Matthew, I love your singing, or, you know, I'm really anointed, or, you know, whatever. So, boyfriend was jealous, you know. Well, I'm a Christian, too. Of course he is. How many times do we try and find things to be jealous over? Okay, chapter 14. I'm sorry, chapter 13. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send out for yourself men, so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. <clears throat> this is called sending out the spies. And I'm telling you something. This is incredible. These are not, he did not send flunkies. He sent the leaders of the tribes. These were well-respected, lifted up, trained men of leadership. Verse 3, so Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord, all of them who were the heads of the sons of Israel. Pedigrees, and then they give their pedigree here, all the way through chapter, verse 16. And in verse 17, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said, go up there to the Negev, and then go up into the hill country. See what the land is like, whether the people who live in it are weak or strong, whether there are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? How are the cities? Are they open, or do they have walls around them, fortifications? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? <clears throat> Make an effort, then, to get some of the fruit of the land. Now, the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land. Um... Verse 23, and they came to the valley of Eshkol, and from there they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men. That was quite a cluster. 
shows you how big and fruitful the land was, with some of the pomegranates, the figs. And uh, that place was called the Valley of Ishol because of the cluster. Ishol means cluster in Hebrew, uh, which the sons of Israel cut down from there. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, <coughs> they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told them and said, we went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large, and moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land, and the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, so on and so forth. Verse 30. Now, it tells you that the people were excited by this next sentence. And Caleb quieted the people <laughs> before Moses. They were, they were ranting and raving, you know. Oh, no! Enemies! Hardships! Tests! Trials! Obstacles! This was the land of milk and honey, not the, you know, roadblocks and trials. No, it's the land of milk and honey, roadblocks and trials. <laughs> Welcome to the ministry. I wanted to do an album called Welcome to the Ministry. You know, the, the, the verse of the song, the verse of the song, the title song was going to be, you know, well, you've just gotten filled with the Spirit and your wife and you are getting along and 40 people show up at the door and your refrigerator is empty and they want to be fed. You know, welcome to the ministry. You know, and all kinds of, all kinds of problems that come up. That's, that's probably my favorite sentence, my favorite comeback line. When somebody comes up to me and they go, I just counseled this person and they wouldn't take the counsel and my mother just called me and told me she thought I'm part of George Jones' cult, you know, Jim Jones' cult, and the car's got a flat tire outside and we don't have enough hamburger for dinner tonight. And I go, welcome to the ministry. <laughs> Welcome to the ministry. I'm sure that you'll be using that quite a bit around here. Somebody comes up and starts complaining. I'm, I would have loved Moses to turn around and tell everybody when they complain, Welcome to the ministry! <laughs> <laughs> Caleb quieted the people down, verse 30, before Moses, and said, We should by all means go up and take the possession of it, for we shall overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. Here's a man of faith. We will overcome it. God's giving it to us, isn't he? The other people are looking at circumstances. The key scripture in this, and I don't know where it is right now, we walk by faith and not by sight. Anybody know where that scripture is? 2 Corinthians 5. We walk by faith and not by sight. Caleb went in, he saw the obstacles, but he saw through the obstacles. Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. It's almost like the cross was glass and he could see through the cross to Sunday morning, to Easter morning. I was, another song I was gonna, uh, that I'm working on, it's called Look Through the Cross to the Joy Set Before You. Look to the cross and you'll see on the other side. There's two sides of the cross. There's the death side of the cross and the resurrection side of the cross. And so many people want their resurrection on the cross. Or, or worse, they want a padded cross. Posturepedic cross. We're comfortable. <laughs> you know? <laughs> a posturepedic cross, right. Or the pillow. Put a little pillow behind my crown of thorns here. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sun lamp up here. Oh, yes. You know? You know? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. The cross hurts. So many people wish it was like this, you know? It's like, uh, Father, into my hands I commit thy, thy, my spirit, it is finished. I've resurrected, you know. They want the resurrection right there on the cross. No. He laid in the tomb three days. It says in Hosea 6, verse 1, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. 
How come we so instantly, we pray for release from the trial? God, give us release from the trial. And it takes three or four days. Is God slow? No. God could bring it about just like that. Because he wants to see if you have faith or sight. Faith or sight. Faith believes God when it sees the obstacle. Hey, look, everything good comes with pain and obstacles. Look at babies. <laughs> look at labor pains. Look at wars. To have a victory, you must go through battles. Unless you go through battles, you will have no victory. God conforms us to the image of, you know, you've heard this doctrine, I'm sure, over and over again. You might be a diamond, but you're uncut, and you're not worth as much unless you're cut. And God takes out his chisel, and the chisel is trials, and the chisel is testing, and the chisel is obstacles. After all, sandpaper on rough wood hurts, but smooths the finish and makes it worth something more. You know, we're always going, oh, ow, ooh, ow, ooh, oh, God, ow. God goes, do you want to have a smooth finish? Or do you want to have rough corners that can't be varnished? They can't be stained. You know, go ahead and try to paint rough wood. You know what it'll look like? It'll look like somebody's face after they've had 40 years of acne. Yeah. You guys be, have a smooth surface. And the Lord smooths us out with rough sandpaper. And the rougher the sandpaper, the quicker the buffing. Okay? Caleb's got faith. The people don't. Verse 32. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report. There's the key of this part three. Giving a bad report. When you are given a task to do. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy one to him who sent him. So is the lazy messenger. I don't know the exact words. That's in Proverbs. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy messenger to him who sent him. Somebody who doesn't fulfill the job. Moses didn't send them out to bring a bad report. Moses sent them out to get information for what? For conquering the land. God said, this is the promised land. Go and check it out so that you can work out your battle tactics. Not so that you can come back and say, we can't take it. Moses' desire wasn't to see, is it bad so that we don't go in? No. Is it bad? Maybe we're going to have a longer battle than we thought. Maybe see how many men we should send to this front and how many men we should send to that front. You're going to see some incredible army strategy if you read these first five chapters of the Bible. Army strategy doesn't sit back and waiting for God to say, well, you go here and you go there. No, you check out the land. You look at the obstacles. You see, well, let me see. Look, you need, you need a lot more prayer and faith to believe God for a million dollars than you do for a dollar fifty. You got into dollar fifty. I want to buy a few candy bars here for the gang. You don't have it. Well, that's easy. You, know? you pray and then you ask the guys, hey, can I? <laughs> you know? Yeah, a lot of people do that. We need a million dollars, God. We want to build a center over here or whatever. Oh, man. That's a bigger obstacle, it requires a lot more faith and a lot more intense prayer. Moses went to see the level of prayer, faith, and battle. That's why he sent the spies out. The level, write that down, the level of prayer, the level of faith, and the level of battle and warfare that was going. That's why he sent the spies out. Not to get some rotten, bad report back of lack of faith. See, what the people giving a bad report don't realize is that they don't have any choice. They're either going to die in the wilderness. They can try to go back to Egypt. Ha ha, you think God's going to open the Red Sea going backwards? <laughs> God's going to give you a miracle to retreat? <laughs> you better not believe it. You'll drown in the Red Sea if you try to retreat. It's a one-way ticket. When you step out into the wilderness of faith, it's a one-way ticket. You either die in the wilderness or you enter the promised land. You cannot go back to the world. Many people think they can. They act like they do, but they're never the same. They're jaded, they're cynical, they're sarcastic. Some of them turn reprobate. I'm not talking about backsliding. I'm talking about completely turning your back on the Lord and denying Him. They spiritually die out in the wilderness. So the sons of Israel gave a bad report. When God sends you to do something, this is like it. This is, this is what a bad report is. Let's pray for this girl's healing. She's blind. The person comes and goes, Oh, but she's been blind from birth. I don't believe this. I don't think she can get healed. 
all of a sudden the curse of God of unbelief. Everybody starts going, yeah, she hasn't been blind from birth. This is a hard thing to pray for. Do you think it's any easier for God to heal a cold than it is for him to grow back legs? Do you think it's any harder for him to heal a cavity? I mean, do you think it's any harder for him to grow back eyes and sockets than it is to heal a cavity or to heal a pimple? <laughs> What's hard for God? Is anything hard for God? It's only hard for us to believe because we're creatures of sight and senses. We're creatures that have learned to habitually trust the five physical senses rather than trust the sense of faith that God puts in our heart through the Spirit of God. Caleb came back and said, God will give it to us. He promised it to us. See, Caleb was thinking. He goes, well, what's the other choices? <laughs> Let me see. we got the wilderness out here, and we've, had, we've been tired of that. Then there's Egypt. I don't think they'd like us very much back there after we drowned their whole army in the Red Sea. <laughs> These people are so stupid. When you don't have faith, you start thinking of stupid things. I've seen backsliders think of the stupidest things. Idiotic. No sense at all. No intelligence. It's as if I'm dealing with three-day-old people. <laughs> you know? I can't believe it. I can't believe some of the things people come up with. They're, pr they're worshiping God, and all of a sudden, there was a girl we put a whole year into. We put a year of faith and love and trust into her. And then she felt called, you know, she had a call from a boyfriend, that's what happened. She felt called to go up to another city and try out her ministry up there. And all these spiritual reasons. There's nothing, there's only one thing worse than a backslider, a spiritualized backslider. There's only one thing worse than a sinner, a sinner that does it in the name of the Lord. I really have a burden for blondes. You know. You know. That's the only, somebody says, look, I want to go out and find a chick. Okay, gut, level, flesh, at least he's honest in his sin. You know, it doesn't mean he's any more righteous. He's just an honest sinner. There's only one thing worse, a spiritual sinner. There's only one thing, the, the thing that God hates the most is spiritual hypocrisy. God, Jesus, yelled and whipped the Pharisees out of the temple. He never yelled and whipped tax gatherers and prostitutes. Outright honest sinners that say, look, I want the world... He came to them lovingly, saying, look, you don't understand the world. But spiritual hypocrisy, they understood the world perfectly, and they also understood the Word. And they still were hypocrites and justified it and murdered the righteous ones. There's nothing worse than a Pharisee in God's sight. Just like, just like Aaron and Miriam coming to Moses, going, God speaks through us too. You know, all they're saying is, listen, bud, we're part of your family, and you better share some of the glory with us. We don't like you getting all the attention, all the blessings. Like, you know, God speaks through us too. And the Lord heard it. <laughs> so here's the spy. Verse 32, they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, now look, now, now, now they're going to exaggerate. They're justifying. Listen to this. The land through which we have gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of, they're giants. They're men of great, they're 40 feet tall with one eye and big clubs. <laughs> hey, first they come back saying, hey, there's a lot of people in there. We don't, you know, and Caleb goes, no, you're giving a bad report. And so now in justification, what happens? Their sin grows. Have you ever seen a little kid when they lie? Just a little lie. No, uh, yeah, Mom, I, I, um, I read the book. Well, I saw you. You weren't reading the book. You were playing the game. Then you have to lie to cover that up. Well, I was reading the book outside before I came in to play the game. Well, I didn't see you go outside. You were inside the whole time. Well, I climbed out through my window. But your window's got a lock on it, and you don't know how to open it. I learned how to open it. You know, and on and on and on and on. One lie leads to another. One bad report leads to another bad report, and the flesh grows on and on and on. It's like a wart. You know. Lies grow on you like warts. Uglier and uglier, bigger and bigger, unable to hide them more and more. Sin and evil will grow like that. And lack of faith grows. And faith grows. You sow to faith, you'll get more faith. You sow to lack of faith, you'll get more lack of faith. 
If you read the Bible, you'll want to read it more. If you don't read it, you'll not want to read it more. If you pray, you'll want to pray more. It's the law of sowing seeds and reaping fruit. It, it works in everything. If you love your wife, you'll have more love for your wife. If you neglect your wife, you'll have more opportunity to neglect your wife. On and on and on. It's all, it's the law of Jesus. Who He said, whatever man reaps, so, whatever man sows, so, so shall he reap. Can I say that ten times real quick? It's really incredible that here they are saying in verse 28, 27, the land does flow with milk and honey, and, and this is its fruit. It's a great land. But here in 32, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. With the sweat and the curse of the land. You know, what is this? A minute ago, they're saying it's flowing with milk and honey. Now they're saying the land is devouring the people. It's a horrible land. You shouldn't go in there because they're justifying their sin. Verse 33, there also we saw the Nephilim. Anybody here know what the Nephilim is? They're giants in the land that were in the time of Noah when the sons of God had children. This is, these are, these, there's all kinds of rumors and theologies and theories of what they are. What some people said they were, I've heard, is, is uh, people through occult practices that had sex with demons and had, you know, like rosemary babies type stuff. Um, I don't know what they are, but they were at least a myth, at least a mythological character that people believed were true, like Bigfoot or the abominable, abominable snowman, you know. Anyway, they're telling stories now. They're telling wives' tales. Oh, we saw some of them, too. We saw Bigfoot in there, you know. We saw, you know, eagles with lion's heads, you <laughs> know. And we became like grass. Now look at this sentence. What an incredible sentence. We became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. We became small and little and easy to eat like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. In other words, we became frightened and cowardly and no courage in the Lord. Therefore, let me give you a little example. If anybody's ever studied organic farming, you will know that a healthy plant is not desirable to bugs and disease. Bugs like to eat plants that are not healthy. Diseased plants have bugs all over them. For some reason, God put in bugs, in plant-eating bugs, in insects, a taste for rotting, diseased plants, so that to whoever has, more shall be given, and to whoever has not, even what he thinks he's got shall be taken away. Meaning... Whoever has health, the Spirit of God, spiritual health, the Spirit of God will anoint that spiritual health. And to whoever who lacks spiritual health, you'll be a prey for every sort of spiritual insect there is in the spirit realm. Demons and demonic spirits cannot really attack a man that has the armor of faith, righteousness, salvation flowing all over him, the oil of gladness, the Spirit of God. Demons like insects look for people that are afraid, that have no faith, that have a diseased spirit. And it's the same way throughout nature. It's the same way throughout the spirit realm. Okay? So we became grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. It's heavy scripture. Now, chapter 14. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and all the people wept that night. Who they listen to? Caleb? Mm -mm. The, bad the bad report. It's so much easier to listen to juicy gossip. To Rona Barracuda. <laughs> the spiritual gospel gossip reporter. Find out who you should be praying for and why. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, did you hear about the pastor's wife? We should pray for her. No, what did she do? Well, let's talk about it, and then we'll pray. And you never get to pray, you just talk. You ever had that happen? It's usually about people in authority and elders. Every now and then. You know, you know, juicy gossip is people that are, when you get juicy gossip, it's people that are in authority or famous or whatever. You know, People love to talk about Andre Crouch's private life, but you know, Joe Blow, they don't care about. People love to talk about people that are in authority or in the spotlight. And guess who they pick on? 
the first two. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. At least Moses got, you know, he got some help here. He got some grumbling off to Aaron here. And the whole congregation said to them, Would that we have died in the land of Egypt. Here comes Egypt again, folks. Or would that we have died in this wilderness. God says, I'll oblige you, don't worry. And why is the Lord bringing us into this land? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land? To fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And listen to this, verse 4. So they said to one another, let who? Let us appoint a leader. Let who appoint a leader? Let us appoint a leader, not God, and return to the world. <laughs> oh, the stubbornness of the people of Israel. And how much severer punishment will he deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was, pan, past tense, sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of grace. The first scripture we read was, For if they did not escape who warned them from earth, how shall we escape who are being warned from heaven? Therefore, let us not reject whom, him who is speaking to us. Do not think this does not apply to us. Let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Let's go back to the world, backwards. Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron, what, here's the proper response of a man of God. Did they take out their theological books and preach a sermon on obedience? Did they tell them how they were all rebelling and not believing? No, they fell on their faces. Glory to God. In the presence of all the assembly and of the congregation of the sons of Israel, and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out, spied out the land, tore their clothes. And that's a, that's a Jewish custom of boy. <laughs> and they spoke to all the congregations of the sons of Israel. Whenever somebody tore their clothes, it was showing total disapproval, spiritual disapproval. It was, it was you renting your own clothes, your own garments, going, I, you know, it was repentance. It was, only, it was intercession. That's what it was. They tore their clothes, threw ashes on their heads, and they would repent and intercede for the people. They spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, Listen, the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. Here's faith. Here is faith. If the, Lord is, if the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they shall be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Here is wisdom. Here is sound counsel. Here is men of faith, preaching faith. Now Moses and Aaron were the ones grumbled against. They fell on the floor. They're not even preaching. Who's preaching? Joshua and Caleb. They're deacons, so to speak. They're under shepherds. Because who's being attacked? A friend of mine, a woman, who is the head, she's not the pastor of a ministry, she's on the council of a ministry. She's been a Christian for 40 years. And she's one of the wisest women I've ever met. She submitted to seven other men in the ministry, but she really runs the ministry. She doesn't want to run the ministry, but she's the wisest girl in the ministry. And she's, she's an old woman, and she doesn't want to be the head of the ministry. And so these seven men run the ministry, but they always come to her for counsel because she's the wisest woman in the ministry. You know, can't help it just because she's a woman. She's wise. Hallelujah. Glory to God for wise women. She said to me once, she says, Keith, I'll put you on a pedestal to shoot you down. They'll put you on a pedestal so that they can shoot you down. Be careful, those of you who seek to be heads of ministries. Because no one gets attacked more than the heads. If you can wound somebody's head, you can, you can kill their ministry. I can cut off my hand and still think and preach. You can cut out my tongue and I can still write and play. But if you wound my head, my brain, my mind, you've destroyed my ministry. And so Satan doesn't bother attacking the hands and the feet. He goes for the head. That's why you should be supporting with loyalty, prayer, and submission those who are above you because they are getting attacked 50 times more than you've ever dreamed of attack. More than you, because if they can get attacked and killed spiritually, then you go too. You go too. See, if Satan can get to the head, the sheep go. 
If the head is intact, he will keep the sheep protected. Moses and Aaron are on their faces. They're not defending themselves. Joshua and Caleb, who are the spies that they sent out in their name, tore their clothes and speaks. Okay, now what is the congregation's reaction to their preaching? We repent. No. Would that be our reaction? Hopefully. Verse 10. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of the meeting of all the sons of Israel. Now here are people who have seen more miracles than any of us have ever dreamed of seeing. Red seas parting, you know, water coming out of a rock. They have their own little water fountain in this little rock, you know. You know, carries with them. Pillar of fire leading them by night. A pillar of smoke leading them by day. Bread falling out of the sky. Their clothes and their sandals are not wearing out. God's appearing to them every other day and warning them, rebuking them with an audible voice. The glory of God shining, not made with light shows and strobe lights, but with glory, is shining on the tabernacle, wherever the Ark of the Covenant is. And the, I mean, you think, God, if we only had those, we'd be men of faith. You know what would happen to you if you didn't have a real faith? You'd grow harder and harder and harder and harder. The people of Chorazin, the people of Bethsaida, saw these miracles, and they got harder and harder. Truth denied equals hardness. Truth denied equals hardness. God turned them over. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Roman 1. And not believing God, God turned them over to a hard heart and a corrupted mind. There's only two spirits in the world. The spirit of man, I'm sorry, the spirit of God, and the spirit of the enemy working on the spirit of man. There's only two forces, not three, not five, not twenty. There's only two men, sorry, two forces doing battle. The spirit of good and the spirit of evil. It's, it goes back in every religion and every philosophy and every culture, good and evil. The American Indians had their spirit of the sun, the white cloud, the black cloud. It's, it's built into the cell of every human being and every chromosome. This struggle is going on. And it's something to realize that we are the battlegrounds for this struggle. Our souls is where it's fought out. And our souls and our, our wills will decide who will win in our souls. Because God is much more powerful than the enemy. But God has made himself only able to move in our lives by the prayers of others or our own wills. In fact, I made a radical statement once that God has limited himself to moving only by the prayers of the saints. I don't know how scripturally true that is, but I believe it because I've never seen it otherwise. God, who do you think was praying for Paul on the road to Damascus? Jesus had just left the earth with the radical teachings of not paying back your enemies evil for evil, but pray for those who persecute you, for those who despitefully use you, love your enemies. Guess who the people were praying for in the upper room? Saul was the biggest vicious Christian hater and killer in the land. Who are they going to pray for? The lower guys? No, the head of Christian killers, the head of Christian persecutors, Saul. They're on their knees, oh God, blind Saul with a blinding light, oh God, open the eyes of Saul. If possible, make him into a believer, like Nicodemus, like Zac Zacchaeus. So God answered their prayer. I am convinced that nothing except the coming of Jesus, and guess what? What's the final prayer? The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Let him who thirsts say, come. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come, come, come. Guess what? The second coming is coming by the prayers of the saints. In fact, in Revelation, it says that incense mixed with the prayers of the saints is ever, ever coming up before the face of God. The smoke out of the censers Mixed with the, which are, it says, which are the prayers of the saints. We say, oh, well, God knows what we have need of. Why pray? Because it says, let your petitions be made known before the Lord. And look at what happens. We've got to get through this. In verse 10, all the congregation said to stone them. Have you ever been tempted? <laughs> tempted. 
real temptation. Not just, you know, don't read your Bible today. I'm talking about when you start thinking, when you enter. Somebody once said, fear is the dark room where your negatives are developed. Fear is the dark room where your negatives are developed. And have you ever been afraid of something? Adultery, fornication, um, stealing, doubting, going to hell, on and on, you know, whatever it is. Satan uses his fear as a foothold and gets in your life. And then he starts telling you, you know, your ministry's a failure, and you'll never make it, and only the saints make it, and you're just not going to make it, and on and on and on. And then you start thinking, now listen to this, you start thinking of backsliding. Now, you didn't start thinking of it, Satan just goes, look at this. Whoosh. And you go, and now you're in such a downer, you know, you start looking at it instead of casting it out. That is kind of pretty, wow, that's really, yeah. Yeah, those were the days of the flesh, oh, the flesh, oh. You know, and then you start enjoying it. Oh boy, if you start enjoying it, you're in real trouble. Then an angel of God comes and starts saying like Joshua and Caleb, the Lord can save you, the Lord can do it, he can strengthen you, and all of a sudden you start, you've enjoyed the vision of the devil so much that you wish you had a stone to stone the angel. Have you ever been in a bad, evil dream and you wake up and you wish you could go back into it? Your flesh wishes it can go back into it? You were having so much fun and you wake up your reaction to that dream will show you where your spiritual state is. Before I was a Christian, I used to dream these dreams, these horrible, R-rated dreams, at least. And I'd wake up and wish I'd go back to sleep. Now, if they come popping into my consciousness or subconsciousness, when I wake up, I start praying hard. Oh, God. Would I react that way? Would I really do that? Oh, God, please. Your reaction in dreams is a really heavy indicator. Your reaction in dreams is a heavy indicator of what you would do in real life. Winky had a teaching on that. It's really incredible. So they're going to stone them. Because they're all of a sudden thinking about Egypt and the leeks and the garlic and the pizzas. Oh, man. Egypt, you know. As if they're so stupid to think the Egyptians would take them back. Idiotic. Foolish as can be. Okay? Verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people spurn me? How long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? I will smite them with pestilence and dispossess them. I will make you, Moses, into a nation greater and mightier than they. Now look at Moses' prayer. An artful map of intercession. An artful, most incredible exercise of intercession. Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it, Lord. For by thy strength thou didst bring this people up from their midst. They will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that thou, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For thou, O Lord, are seen eye to eye. They've heard about the cloud that stands over them. They've heard about the pillar of the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill all these people as if they were just one man, then the nations who have heard of thy fame will say, quote, the Lord could not bring his people into the land which he promised them by oath. Therefore, he killed them in the wilderness. He slaughtered them. In other words, Lord, this will not be too good for thy glory and thy fame throughout the world if you do this thing. Here's a man reasoning with God. Abraham, God, if there's 50 men in Sodom, will you spare righteous men? How about 40? How about 30? Did God rebuke Moses for the way he's talking to him? Mm -mm. Did God rebu rebuke Abraham? Abraham is going, oh Lord, please just suffer me once more. How about ten? Nine and a half? <laughs> if you have a relationship with God this close, you will not deal with him for yourself. You will deal with him in prayer for him. Who was Abraham talking about? The righteous men. Spare the city for the righteous men and for your glory. Who is Moses talking about? Your name, your fame, your glory. You can reason this way in prayer for God's sake. It's very touchy ground. It's very misused and abused theology. People go, well, look how they pray. I'm going to pray. God, um, 
listen, why don't you bless me? <laughs> you know? It doesn't work that way. It only works one way. Okay? Verse 16. Quote, this is what else they're going to say. Because the Lord could not bring this people into the land which he promised them by oath, therefore he slaughtered them in the wilderness. But now I pray, let the Lord of the... The power of the Lord be great, just as thou hast declared. Now look, he sits here and, and he's not reminding God about his own nature. He is proving to God that he believes in his nature. In verse 18, the Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children of the third and fourth generations. That's a whole study in itself, and I'm not going to get into it today on the third and fourth generation thing. But let me tell you, do you think God needs to be reminded about his nature? No. God needs to be reminded that you believe his nature. Because God will not hear your prayers or answer them unless he knows that you know who he is. And you have a relationship with him. This is so beautiful. So beautiful. The Lord is slow to anger, but in loving kindness. Verse 19, Now that I know your nature, God, and you know that I know your nature, pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy loving kindness, just as thou also hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. You've forgiven them over and over again. Please, once more. So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to what? Your word. Right. What an incredible answer. I have, I have pardoned them just as you've asked. Okay? You believe me. Your faith is so amazing, Moses. Your love for me is so beautiful. Your knowledge of my nature. I am so blessed. I am going to impart your faith. I'm going to impart my blessing on all of them because of your faith. Your intercession worked. Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us better than a high priest like Moses. He sits. Like one of the girls from our ministry came up to me afterwards. She says, how does God let us get away with so much? How does God forgive us so easily? I said, because we have a better high priest than Moses. We have a righteous high priest, the Son of God himself, sitting at the right hand, ever liveth to make of intercession for us. In Hebrews, it talks about him, the high priest. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father right now praying for you because you were a jerk yesterday, or whenever you were. God, please, don't account it against them. Let my blood cover this in. Hey, look, if Moses could stand with 600,000 wicked, selfish Jews out in the wilderness, how much more will Jesus be able to stand with us who have his spirit inside? Glory. Glory. Now look at this, verse 20. I have pardoned them according to your word, but indeed as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the, of the Lord. Now look, verse 20, this is incredible. This is incredible. Verse 20, I have pardoned them according to your world, but, sounds like he's going to threaten them. He is. What is he threatening them with? That all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. What kind of a threat is that? I like that idea. Do you? Guess what? If the earth is filled with the glory of the Lord, there's no more room for sin and for sinners. Look at this threat. I've never seen a more positive threat in my life. I have pardoned them according to your word, but indeed, as I live, that's a swearing. God's swearing by his own name, because he can swear by no greater. As I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Listen, Moses, I've pardoned them, but I'm telling you, I'm going to fill this earth with my glory. And there will be no more room at all. There's no more room. For sin. And when I do this, I'm going to destroy the sin or the people. Here's this little statement. You can write this down. God will either kill your sin or you. Take your pick. You have a choice. God will either kill your sin or you. Depends on if you want to hold on to it. If you hold on to your sin, when God comes to destroy and consume all sin by the fire of his wrath, which is the fire of his love, then you will get consumed with it. It's just like, say you wanted to burn some trash. Well, if you have trash in your hand and you want to burn it and you won't let go of it, guess who's got to burn with it? God will either kill your sin or you. Okay? All the earth will be filled. Well, anyway, this goes on and on. I've run out of time. Um, it, it, he doesn't let any of them live, um, except for Caleb and Joshua. 
And he says, I'm going to, listen to this, I'm going to make you go back in the wilderness for 40 years and wander around. Verse 34, according to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days, for every day you shall bear your guilt a year. Even 40 years. But it says, um, verse 24, but my servant Caleb, because he has had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession. Okay. And, uh, Verse 30, surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb and Joshua. Verse 31, your children, however, whom you said would become a prey, I will bring them in, and they shall know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpses shall fall in the wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds for forty years in the wilderness, and they shall suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. Verse 36, as for the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, and who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing out a bad report concerning the land. Let's read that again. As for the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, and who returned and what? Made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing out a bad report concerning the land. Even those men who brought out the very bad report of the land died by a plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive out of those men who went to spy out the land. And closing real quickly, I'm going to read these things real quick. And when Moses spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people mourned greatly. Wait a minute! Forty years in the wilderness! Verse 40. And in the morning, however, they rose up early and went up to the ridge of the hill, saying, Here we are! We have indeed sinned, but now we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised. In other words, we realize that we were wrong for not believing. And, and so we're going to go take it now. But Moses said, why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord when it will not succeed? Do not go up lest you be struck down before your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. The Lord is not with you. For the Amalekites, the Canaanites, will be there in front of you. And you will fall by the sword inasmuch as you have turned back from following the Lord. And the Lord will not be with you. But they went up, not listening or heedlessly, to the ridge of the hill country, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses left the camp with him. Then the Amalekites and Canaanites who lived in the hill country came down and struck them and beat them down as far as Hormah. That means God pronounced a judgment on them. And they said, God might be merciful to us. Let's go on down and do it anyway. God said, no. Moses said, no. They rebelled. That means that obedience mistimed becomes disobedience. Mistimed obedience becomes disobedience. I'll obey now. Too late, folks. There's going to be many people that come before the Lord on Judgment Day going, God, I'll do it now. I'll obey you now. Too late, kids. It's Judgment Day. Glory to God, that will not happen to us. Because he's given us a spirit of obedience. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word in the Old and New Testament. We thank you, Lord, that your judgment is stricter now, Lord, but the requirements you have made easier by your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us your own spirit, which doesn't only come upon us now, but it lives inside of us by your word. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've not asked us to grumble, but you've asked us to believe and give a good report of all men. Give a good report of all ministries. Give a good report of all things that you've made. For you said, behold, everything you made was good. And Lord, we have made evil. And Lord, we repent of that. And Lord, we, we ask your forgiveness for grumbling and murmuring and complaining. Because we know you hate that more than anything else. And it's the greatest proof of our unbelief. God, we want to be believers. Not just in word, but in deed. Oh God, send your blessing of believing faith upon us. And Lord, spank us if we murmur and complain quickly before it grows into the sin of Israel. We love you, Lord Jesus. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, how many people here would want to admit that they've been grumbling, complaining, and murmuring even in their heart, and they want to repent of that now? Raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we all repent of this sin, and we ask that you give us the grace to never do it again, and Lord, by the grace that you supply, we will not do this. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.